Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Taylor. I'm Chief Curator and Deputy Director for Art and Education here at VMFA. And it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. I am going to introduce uh, Dr. Johanna Minich, who is the Assistant Curator for Native American Art here at the museum, and is also the curator responsible for the wonderful Hear My Voice exhibition. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. If you've seen this show, go see it again. If you haven't seen it, you must see the show. It closes here on November 26th. And if you miss it, there's two more venues. It will go to the Taubman Museum in Roanoke and the Museum of the Shenandoah Valley in Winchester. Uh, Dr. Johanna Win uh, Minich is also, in addition to Hear My Voice, the curator of In Our Own Words, a portfolio of prints by Daniel Heyman and Lucy Ganji on view in the Lewis Focus Gallery, also well worth a look, either tonight or another time. Johanna is a guest lecturer on the topic of art, crime, and the looting of pre-Columbian sites through the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts Speaker on the Arts program. She received both her MA and BA in art history from the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia, and her PhD in art history from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. She has taught numerous art history courses at several colleges, universities, and VMFA. She's currently working as a contributing editor on pre-Columbian pottery, a thematic approach to New World ceramics, which will be published by the University of Florida Press in 2018. Please join me in welcoming Johanna to the podium to introduce our guest tonight, Johanna Minich. Okay, is this mic on or do I speak to the other one? Am I on? Yes, okay, perfect. All right, so hopefully you have seen the exhibition. If you haven't, obviously I would encourage you to go. After tonight, you're definitely gonna want to, so you will have a little bit of time after the talk this evening, but certainly you have until November 26th to see this. So our speakers tonight come from three very different backgrounds. They work in three different mediums, but I have had the pleasure of spending some time with them over the last two days, and I have seen very similar approaches in their, number one, in their work ethic, in their dedication to the craft. They're all very material and craft oriented, and they, they really pour themselves into their work. And so they, they do come from very different backgrounds, but they have this really similar need to achieve a certain level of perfection, I would say. Um, oftentimes taking the more difficult path than you would need to, to create the works that they create and to, to get the effect that they want. So when people come up and compliment me on the exhibition, I really feel like saying, as a curator, my work was very easy because all I had to do was find these people. And so they make my job very easy because all of the work has already been done in the minds and the hands of these artists. And so again, I really want you to appreciate what you see when you go in. So I'm gonna introduce the three artists right up front so we don't have to have a lot of interruption. And then we will have a few, probably 15 minutes or so at the end for you guys to ask questions. Molly Murphy Adams is a fiber and beadwork artist. She earned her BFA from the University of Montana in 2004. And she works in sculptural beadwork, mixed media fiber art, and also printmaking. She's a descendant of the Ogallala Lakota tribe. She was raised in Montana. And she's actually a recent transplant to my hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Jeremy Frey is an eighth generation basket weaver from the Passamaqua uh, Passamaquoddy tribe in Maine. And he uses the traditional materials and techniques to create really truly innovative and unique baskets that have won him international acclaim. In fact, in 2011, he won best of show in both the Santa Fe Indian Art Fair and the Herd Guild Market and Fair, which are both very prestigious juried shows uh, in the Southwest. And, and not only did he win both of those the same year, but that was also the first time that a basket had won best of show. So he is definitely breaking new ground in his uh, chosen medium. And then Virgil Ortiz is a Cochiti Pueblo potter whose recent work is focused mainly on the history of the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. And he draws on the Cochiti traditions of storytelling, social commentary, and also building large-scale ceramic figures. He's another uh, famous internationally known artist. He has a wide range of talents. He's worked in the fashion industry with Donna Karen. 
and he has his own jewelry line that he's designed that is available through the Smithsonian um, Museum. And so tonight I want to welcome Molly, Jeremy, and Virgil to the stage. Uh, I'm going to begin, uh, I think each of us is going to take a few minutes to speak directly about our work and our pieces here at the, uh, at the exhibit and also uh, a little bit about what we do and why we do it. Um, do we know when this will queue up, photos? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go ahead and talk about my piece that's in the exhibit. Uh, my piece in the exhibit is titled... Uh, Commonwealth, uh, Commonwealth Project, and the, ta the theme of it that was introduced to me uh, was of hear our voices or hear my voice um, was open to interpretation and each of us artists that were asked to make a spe specific piece for the show was allowed to interpret that as we chose. Um, I thought a lot about how I would approach that and uh, I integrate a lot of science and map, cartography, and history research into uh, my beadwork. And uh, so for this piece, I decided I wanted to do specifically a map-based um, cartographic work that would incorporate uh, the history of waterways in Virginia, and specifically the language, um, the place names of those waterways in Virginia, and how those place names have uh, had a continuity through all of the cultural changes and political changes within the region that is now the state of Virginia. And so I approached it from a historical aspect, starting with doing uh, research with maps and documents and, and looking at a lot of historic maps, and then doing research into the um, river names in the area and, and where those names originated from, the early tribes uh, pre-contact, and how those names evolved over time to the names that everybody would recognize now. And I picked six of those rivers to represent uh, in complementary panels uh, alongside the central map piece. And I chose the materials for my piece. Um, I work in contemporary beadwork, and beadwork is something that's very recognizable as a native art form. Um, but what most people don't understand when they're looking at it is that beadwork is a very contemporary art form, and it's an art form of hybridization and integration of new materials and new ideas. Um, glass beads are not a North or South American indigenous material. They're an introduced material. And so by their very nature, I think that they are um, changing and contemporary because every woman that used those throughout time was doing something brand new in that moment. Uh, the piece that's up here now is uh, a series of portraits, photo etchings. The center one is myself uh, in regalia. And then the side uh, two panels is my great-grandmother. And then the other portrait is her parents and her siblings when she was away at boarding school. So it shows the continuity of beadwork and beadworkers in my family. Uh, my great-grandmother is wearing a dress that her mother made. And then in the other portrait, while it appears that the family is wearing all Anglo clothing, uh, her younger brother actually has a boy's suit that is um, entirely quilled in floral patterns there on the right. So it's a little bit hard to discern from the photo etching process. So I took these old family photos and reproduced them in etchings and then have been adding beadwork on paper to uh, turn it into a, both a document and a portrait. So the, the piece that is in the museum, um, the materials are, that are chosen for that piece with beads, fabric, silk, uh, one thing that you'll probably note that is absent and is also almost entirely absent in this piece that's up here, um, this is a cradle board. Most cradle boards that you would see would have a lot of leather and hide and fringe and other elements like that. Um, I work almost entirely with silk velvet and Thai silk and uh, contemporary fabrics. Um, I do a lot of hand-dyed wool. And my intent with that is, is very specific to 
combine to show that I'm using contemporary materials that anyone could go out and buy tomorrow. And then, but what you would do with it would be very different than what I would do with it. So once I've taken those materials that anyone can go out and buy, and I put it through my uh, experiences and my knowledge, I come out with a result that might look native to an audience, but it also has a lot of elements that are very contemporary, very modern, very much about fashion, the symbolism, our digital age, and, uh, and also about myself as a person who comes from a hybrid background. I'm not full native, I come from a very mixed background, and so that is reflected in the materials and the imagery that I use. This piece was a cradle board that won Best of Show at the Herd, and uh, the center of each flower actually lifted up, rotated 180 degrees, set back into the beadwork, and had areas for portraits of the parents and grandparents of the child, and then it had hidden folders made out of brass that would slide out of um, areas in the back of the cradle board to uh, store the documents of the child so it would become a record keeper uh, physically as well as symbolically. And that's a close-up uh, detail shot of the beadwork. I will probably never, ever use Delicas again for a solid <laughs> background. <laughs> they have a beautiful tone and reflection, but they are unforgiving. Uh, so I mentioned using digital uh, symbols in work. The piece that's here at the VFMA have, um, has six QR codes in it. And this is another example of a piece that I'm using using QR codes. My intent with the QR codes is to uh, literally embed text and messages in the work rather than only symbolically. And they do read. Um, they are not purely ornamental. Uh, sometimes the lighting in museums, which is subdued for archival purposes, is not very forgiving or helpful to the <laughs> programming that wants really stark contrast, but they do read. Um, and so the piece that's in this slide is a sewing box that told a Lakota story of Anagite in eight parts. And the uh, piece that's in the exhibit here, um, each QR code tells a little bit about the history, the native language of the river names and just some other sort of tidbit. And it's written almost in a poetry form. It's meant to be a little bit lyrical. Um, so that the information that's in there can be accessed. And it's in a binary code that really, the binary code almost doesn't have culture. It's very stark. But I really like the graphic element that we recognize from commercial stuff uh, to be embedded in something surprising. As far as I know, I'm the only person beating QR codes. But I'm sure that will change. <laughs> momentarily, although I kind of challenge people. I'm like, go ahead and try, because it's, <laughs> it, it's not easy. Uh, some of my other work that um, would be less recognizable as having a cultural background are these uh, installation pieces I'm doing with beadwork on bristle board, and the bristle board is mounted onto uh, birchwood panels and then installed in large grids. So I work with grid, repetition, and pattern, and taking uh, elements of beadwork and breaking them down and repeating them and in different ways. Also in obsessive compulsive large installation <laughs> ways. Uh, this was a commission piece for the Sam Noble Museum in uh, Norman, Oklahoma. And it has QR codes. My first uh, embrace of QR codes was to embed scientific information. And so for this piece, it's a folding codex uh, that has the Latin and common names of two endangered or threatened species on each panel, and then uh, a realistic representation of those species on each panel. And I don't think I'll ever bead shellfish ever again, because that, <laughs> that was problematic. I don't know why I'm pointing it at the screen. It's not the TV. I don't need to. Uh, some of my work that's more uh, sculptural and perhaps less commentary or less political is uh, I do a lot of folding boxes, opening boxes. And this one depicts the uh, scissor tail flycatcher that's an iconic symbol in Oklahoma. And that's not mine. Um, so I got off. The, my temptation is always to get off theme. And the, the idea with, behind the place names was to specifically, um, hopefully, get people to say the river names and to understand that that's, those names uh, are ancient, and they come from languages that are literally the voices of people that we don't really know their names anymore, we don't know their people, but some of their um, 
some of their language and some of their voice comes down through those place names in perpetuity as long as we keep using them. And the other aspect that's in the piece that isn't obvious at first is the, I also traced over the political boundaries. And so we have the, the map work with the water and the landscape, sort of the permanency of it, and then there are the political boundaries of what became the Commonwealth of Virginia through its colonial charters, uh, different uh, boundaries of statehood, and some of the British restrictions on expansion in the West. And uh, each of those borders is outlined in a different color on the map, so you can trace the adjusting political boundaries uh, through time on the map as well. And the title. And the title. Oh, and the title is the Commonwealth Project, um, or Map Commonwealth Project. And uh, when I was looking at all of the different nomenclatures, I'm focusing on the non-Anglo nomenclature. But then I love actually the term commonwealth because I think there's this um, real power in language and that the idea of a commonwealth is that we hold our wealth in common for each other, for future, for past, and that um, there's a lot of power in those words of how we choose to name something and that it can be kind of a touchstone to come back to and, and remind about certain values. And so that was the, the choice of the name rather than giving it a state name or an esoteric name or if I really run out of names, I just start using things like Black Form One or something. The, the artist fallback, where you just give it a name that sounds really mystical and, and, and nobody can understand it. What did I leave out that I was going to say? Oh, there's so much I could ask you, but we'll, I know. Yeah, I'll wait. I know, <laughs> but I think, I've gone, I think I've gone pretty far. Oh, the tattoo, these supplemental designs on the side panels. The center map has floral designs and then the map, and then the six supplemental panels that have the QR codes also have uh, two different types of abstract designs uh, flanking the QR codes. And uh, I used Cherokee basket designs, and I also used uh, tattoo and body art and painting designs that were evident from old, uh, old research, from old uh, drawings, etchings uh, during the colonial era that showed how people would mark their bodies to project their identity, and then the baskets are how people mark their objects and their utilitarian things to project their identity, as well as the place names, so complementing the place names as a projection of, uh, of use and of the personality of the place. And now I think I've covered everything, because I could go on and on, but that would not be polite. <laughs> well, thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, okay. So, um... Jeremy Frey. Um, this is my piece. My work uh, comes directly from, basically from my family and my tribal history and um, all of my experiences. Um, when I first got into basketry, I was an adult, and the basket tradition, it's a long, long tradition, but it was really suffering um, as far as carriers of the tradition and, and high-end knowledge of the craft. And so from the very beginning, one of my initial goals was to try and master and bring back and even create new things that were deeply based in tradition. And so for a long time, um, I only use materials that I could harvest myself. I wouldn't, like there's, there are some commercial dyes in this. I still harvest all my own materials, but for the longest time I wouldn't even dye my work. Um, and that's kind of been my goal, is to just constantly strive to, to grow our, our base tradition of weaving to something, I don't know where it's going. I don't know, this is, this is the latest version of where it's gone, but um, the piece itself is kind of, it's an homage to one of my mother's teachers, and it's also a little bit of speaking about um, the use of newer materials, but they're still, they're still locally harvested, you know, semi-traditional materials. Like the cedar bark, we don't traditionally use, but that center, that center basket is all braided cedar bark, um, which is just an innovation that I've been working with. 
Um, and really the whole basket is kind of innovative. When I first started weaving, um, I used to try and refine and refine and refine the work down. And one of the first things I would do was when you start a basket, well, originally, when I first started weaving, they didn't really even weave the bottoms. They just put them together, wove the sides and the cover, and it was pretty, but if you picked it up or looked at it in any close way, it was made really fast. Um, and so the first thing I started doing is weaving the bottoms completely and just adding a really fine, fine detail, even though you would never see it. You might see it if you look inside. But I had a friend who made chairs that came by my studio one day, and he said, uh, because I was putting points on a basket. But it was before you put those points on, it's just a flat woven basket. And he said, that's beautiful. I said, well, it's not even done. It's, like, it's basically a skeleton. He said, no, no, that's awesome. I love it like that. And I said, well, you know, this is what I'm doing. So I finished it, but I got to thinking, you know, that weave is beautiful, but it's too simple. So how can I do the beautiful weave without the points, but still make it kind of what I'm going for, is just really working the material down to just, just as far as it'll go. And what I come up with was um, what I call the fine weave basket. And you can see it in the top, that solid white weaving. And in the very base of the basket, all that solid white weaving came from that original conversation. And so my very first attempt to do that, I didn't know anything about material thicknesses or you know, how to space pieces or anything. It was early on, so I made this basket that was all teeny, teeny weave, and it was solid, but it all kind of crushed under its own weight, and it was crooked. I was super proud of it at the time, but um, my mother still has that. And it's <laughs> <laughs> I gave her another one. I gave her another one for her birthday years later, and one, one of them is like hard and perfect, and the other one's all crooked and sad. And <laughs> But they're made on the same form, and they're, and they're uh, made in the same technique, and they just, yeah, I figured it out, I guess. So, and, and, and I guess, you know, all, everything about this piece is, is based on the idea of growing the art form. It's not a nesting basket, it's just one piece, but it's meant to look like a, a nesting basket. And I do a whole series of these. Um, for a while, I, was, I struggled with the idea of craft versus art, um, and this is another version of the same weave that's on the bottom. No, I, I struggled with the idea of craft versus oh, art, and so my pieces, I started trying to think of a of way to be sculptural with them, or make them non-functional, or maybe tell a story. Um, and it's still, I mean, it's still, it's a high-end craft, but you can, you, can, you can make it into an art form. So this was my first real, this one here, I really just went nuts. It wasn't supposed to look pretty. It was all tech. This is a technique basket. Um, and it does look nice. But I really just wanted to play with nice. what, what the wood. <laughs> it's beyond nice. nice. <laughs> I wanted to play with what the wood could do. It really, there was no point to it. It was just like, all right, let's. And so I've got all this stuff coming out everywhere. And the bottom looks really cool, too. I don't have a picture of that. But it's just this crazy... If you look in the bottom corner of the screen, it's covered with points down the bottom. And, but you can see the fine weave. You know, it's just, it's just all kinds of stuff. Now, I didn't put braids in this, and I didn't do any really extra work in this because that, the braids take forever. And this was really an, explore, an exploration piece. And I figured if it worked, maybe I'd do one later with braids and with, other, with more work in it. So that's kind of how that story goes. This, again, just attempting to use materials differently. I turned the handle and I put these spikes in there and they, they became, it, it was kind of a neat, I wish you could see the process on that one because it was really a pain. <laughs> but um, the final result was great. Um, urchin basket, this is what I was working on the other day. I'll be working on one of these um, tomorrow during my demo. And it's um, probably my most popular basket now. Um, it was an old design, and I remember when I was coming up and weaving and doing different things, I was thinking, every time I'd see, I used to go to this shop that sold only our baskets, and they had these antiques and this big glass cube, and there were these urchins, and I, I man, I can't weave, because you have to weave straight in to the center of a circle, and if you pull, well, it all wants to go loose. And I knew that it would take a lot of technique to get them right. And so after so many years, I finally tried it, and, and they started working out. 
but it took a it took a long time. I'm actually trying to get to uh, more of the. Uh, <laughs> so these are urchins as well. So this is a traditional design. This is very traditional. Um, they're called corn baskets, and that was just a large order we had. And I just I thought I'll never see this many corn baskets together ever again because it takes a long time to make one. And so I wanted to get a, a neat picture of it. So and that's what they look like with the uh, while they're open, so they're completely <laughs> functional. Everybody thought they were real, right? <laughs> yeah. No, no feast tonight. So this piece is the largest piece I've ever done. And there's so many things going on there. The, the uprights um, are completely woven with a tiny weave. And there's solid wood inside. Uh, it's a double top. You can see where there's two false, there's a false top. Um, and then there's porcupine quill work on the top, which is, I've been flipping through to find the porcupine quill work. I talk about that a lot on stage, but I never have images, so put a bunch on here tonight. Um, the porcupine quill is really a way for me to put what I would say is definitely art, because I'm drawing pictures, I'm painting with it, you know? There's no, there's no debate. And again, um, when you think about I mean, it really doesn't matter what it's called, I guess, as long as, as, long as I like doing it and people like to see it. Um, but that's kind of what's driven me to where I am now, is just different topic ideas, different challenges. But yeah, that's pretty much what I do and, and why I do it. <laughs> so I'm going to hand Thank this you. off. Virgil. That's cool. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Virgil Ortiz. I'm from Coach de Pueblo. And I want to start off by thanking um, VMFA, Johanna, and the entire staff that are here. And we're very lucky to be here. I'm very happy to be here at this awesome museum. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Um, my, what I do is I was born into a family of potters. Um, so on my mother's side, they're all potters. And like making it the, um, the pottery at Cochiti with the tr traditional methods and materials is a dying art form. So like all of the masters of our mother's age, she, we lost her in 2007, and she was like 78 years old. So in that age group, all of the masters are dying out, and the families that are left behind with them have a hard time to continue this tradition because everybody has a job off of the Pueblo, and it's really hard for everybody to really make a living at it if they try it because it takes, it's, a, it's a lot of time invested in to make making uh, a pottery with traditional methods and materials. We go dig all our own clays. We get the temper at a separate place in the Pueblo. Um, we make our uh, paint by um, boiling the wild spinach plant. And that takes like a whole week to do it, but like as providing that we have all the materials together and prepared um, to make one of the figurative potteries that you'll see upstairs um, will probably take about three to four weeks to complete. Um, the method that I use is all coil and scrape method. So like with all the different figures that you'll see in the, in the images are all um, solid at the bottom at their feet. And like from the ankles up, they're all coiled and scraped. And uh, that's how I was taught to make them. So back in the 1800s, all of the pieces from Cochiti Pueblo were up to like three feet and above that, si that size. But after, um, when the non-natives first arrived to the Pueblo, they had destroyed a lot of the um, figurative pottery and the pottery in general. Um, the natives were accused of uh, witchcraft and sorcery, so they were tripped out at when they seen it, so they destroyed a lot of the pieces. Um, in the 1800s, uh, Kojiti people were making pieces that turned into uh, using social commentary, um, incorporating that into the figurative pottery. So, like. Around that time, when all the railroads were being laid in Cochiti, I mean through Cochiti area, uh, that brought along like operas and um, the circuses and different sideshows that you'll see uh, that people seen back then. So and the pieces from the 1800s uh, re were really really cool. Like a lot of them had like Siamese twins or tattooed bodies or just really um, pretty cool pieces <laughs> like with what they made and what they seen. But once the non-natives figured out that they were caricatures of themselves, they put a stop to it. So Cochiti lost all of that whole tradition of the size, and then it was reborn as a storyteller. Um, 
um, some of you might know what a storyteller, a storyteller is. It's like a, a, a grandmother or grandfather um, person or, a, or an animal holding all their babies, and that's what Cochiti is known for right now. And that was born like in the 30s. But a lot of people don't know about the pieces that were made in the 1800s and all the social commentary that came with it. So growing up, um, we, one of these um, collectors out of Albuquerque by the name of Robert Gallegos had always would uh, come to visit my mom and our father and check out to see what my siblings and I would be making to see what would take uh, the clay up and continue the tr tradition of making it. Um, he had seen that my pieces were starting to change, um, not from like the traditional stuff, what my mom was making and what our family was taught, but they started morphing into standing figures and getting larger and um, more caricature looking. And like when I was around 15, he had asked my parents to take me down to his uh, showroom in Albuquerque. And my parents took us down and we went inside and all our, all our mouths opened because it was a crazy sight to see because all of my pieces that I was making like when I was 15 resembled the pieces from the 1800s. He had the largest collection of those pieces. Um, so at that point in my life, I really knew that was what I was going to dedicate my life to, is to really keep that tradition going and make sure that make that connection to the next generation. But again, you have the problem of people not growing up with it how I did. So it's really hard to train people. Um, I take on that challenge no matter if they're kids or they're my age or older, but again, they have jobs and it's really hard for them to continue it. So I had to really think of a way how to make that connection and to not let it die out. And as well as incorporate of telling the story of the 1680 Pueblo revolt that happened in, um, in New Mexico to all the Pueblos there. It's not taught in our schools. It's not taught, um, in our history books, or it's not in our history books, um, none of the schools teach it. It's been swept under the carpet basically because of the genocide that did happen. So that is like, I dedicate my life to help to educate the world about what happened in the 1680 Pueblo Revolt, and as well as to keep the tradition alive of making the pottery uh, with traditional methods and materials. So remembering like when I was growing up, um, I went to go see the first Star Wars movie, and I was like seven then dating myself, <laughs> but, but uh, I seen it, the movie one time, it was during Indian Market in Santa Fe in that summer, um, and I had learned, and like my cousins and my siblings, we all learned the characters, uh, how they dressed, what they looked like, how they, what they wore, um, and I'm sure all of you guys know the Star Wars saga, but I, by the time I was like maybe 20, then I started saying, okay, I could like write a movie script about um, the Pueblo Revolt and really make that connection to the kids. So that's what I did. And then you'll see all of me incorporating like in all my figurative pottery to bring in the pieces and how the, uh, the social commentary was brought into it from the 1800s. Tell the story of the Pueblo Revolt. Um, then I started using all the other different mediums that I do work in and I'll flip to them really quick so you get a quick example. But it's, it allows me to reach and use in like my photography, uh, my fashion design, jewelry, um, body painting. So I would, I made, I developed 19 characters that represent the 19 Pueblos that are left in New Mexico today. So you'll see different characters and the pieces upstairs, they're called the aeronauts. And the aeronauts are characters that are pilots in, in my movie script. So you'll see different examples of how I, I can show the public like really develop him as a tight character. I'll take the bodies, um, paint them, which I'll be doing tom tomorrow for the example. So I'll photograph them, use Photoshop, or get them as um, to the final character design as I can, and really develop the character so you'll see exactly what they look like. <laughs> this is an example of a photo from Ben Wittick from the 1800s on the left side. And that photograph had always stuck in my mind when I had seen it and I made up my mind that I wanted to recreate it and make sure that we keep that tradition going. Um, and I decided to ask my family members to take a look at that picture and decide which ones they really liked and to recreate it. So I had done a show in Prague and walking over the St. Charles Bridge or the Charles Bridge and I started photographing it because it reminded me of the background of the Wittick photo. And when I got back then, 
I asked my family members, let's go do this. So what happened is like they chose their favorite ones, they recreated it. Uh, my nephews and I set it up in my studio. Um, these were, and I told them to go for the larger size. So like we tried to recreate the sizes that were the original pieces. So they're like up to three feet tall. So we really tried our hardest to rec recreate this image. We had them all tied up with, um, with fishing wire <laughs> because they were just on boxes under a faux rug, <laughs> I mean skin. And we, I just dropped out the background, took the photograph, dropped out the background and inserted the, the Charles Bridge image. And um, it, had, um, it was displayed at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe. And I wanted to keep all 21 pieces together and try to sell it as a group. And by the fall of that summer, um, Cartier from Paris had called. And they asked about this whole um, group of pottery figures. And it, they're now in the permanent collection in Paris. So <laughs> it's kind of a cool story. Here's some quick examples of all the different, like the circus sideshow characters that um, are replicas of pieces from the 1800s. So you'll notice all the different opera singers with their little booties, uh, Siamese twins. Um, some of my family's pieces all together with mine in the back. <laughs> I can tell. So like I said earlier, like all of the, I dedicated my life to educate the world about the Pueblo Revolt. Um, the main character in the movie is Tau. Tau is what the um, grandmothers and the granddaughters address each other. And um, it's a homage to women and for women empowerment. So she's one of the main characters in the movie. I asked my sisters and my nieces to all dress up as the blind archers <laughs> and photograph them. The story behind this was um, when we had a, a big forest fire in the Cochiti Canyon um, in 2011. But I had went back and looked at this. I was scouting out a place to take this image. And all the trees were all black, but some of them had little green buds coming back out. So I thought that was kind of really cool, a really cool background as a rebirth to represent that. Um, my sisters were laughing at it because they couldn't see, but. <laughs> <laughs> Here's an example of what I'll be doing tomorrow is to have some of my friends, they get excited because they, um, they help me with modeling. So I get into body painting and fabricating like all the different masks on them and try to get them to the final tight designs of the character. Some examples of the fabrication for the conquistadors. And that's like the final images of when I, after I take the uh, photos of them. Some, of, some more aeronauts, these are the brothers and sisters from the pieces upstairs. Um, they're driving their spaceships here. And that's when I'm mixing it with my photography and the body painting. Other characters, Tau is on the left-hand side. She's carrying the Castilian's ha hats and a cross. So like also in the um, Star Wars sagas, like you see all the crazy cool um, um, animals in it. So that's how it kind of really picked up a lot of the stories from Kochidi and of course added my twist to it. So you'll see a lot of cool um, animal figures. Some more of the photography. And basically showing how my art, how art inspired by, wait, how, how's that saying? Art inspired by life or <laughs> something like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you can see it. So sometimes I'll um, take a photograph of the model and then recreate it in clay, or either I'll make the clay first and try to recreate it as a photograph. Then I started, oh, there's Studa and Ku here. Those are the pieces that are upstairs. Some of the models dressed up as the Venusian soldiers. And these characters were in the part of the movie where their Pueblo was bombed first by the Castilians in the future. Um, so at this point, they're wearing gas masks and oxygen tanks around their necks. And they're in the, in, um, moving their Pueblo, relocating their Pueblo to another habitable um, part. So that's what these characters are represent. Some more of the fun times when my models are jumping around in the <laughs> studio. <laughs> well, we have a lot of fun doing this with all my nieces and nephews and my friends that model. Incorporating the, with the Photoshop imagery along with them, the pottery. 
So you can see how I'm really bringing them, um, trying to reach out to the kids, the next generation, to really get them. And a lot of them are learning what the characters are and what they do. And they're getting a secret lesson in history <laughs> without knowing. And then I also am able to reach out into the fashion world. So you can see all of the pottery designs that go onto the fashion um, and garments. I was lucky enough to work with Donna Karen and design, uh, work with her in 2002 and 2003. And she gave me an exhibition at her show when we released um, this clothing line. And it was an awesome um, opportunity to reach the fashionistas in the world because, of course, her whole clientele are all fashion people. So when they came to the show and seeing the, the whole line, I was able to tell them and direct them back to Cochiti and like where they come from, from the Cochiti designs. And then we also did home products as well. So that was pretty exciting to see it and for New York Fashion Week. I wish I was still that young. <laughs> <laughs> so like the more I um, started developing all the different um, products and the garments, and then I started working with leather and coming up with um, handbags. And then the jewelry line that um, we were talking about earlier, that I had the opportunity to design a 96 set, I mean 96 piece um, jewelry line for the Smithsonian that's available at the NMAI in DC and in New York as well. So you'll see the uh, pottery designs on them too. Um, this is my latest uh, um, series called Taboo. And I basically went back to the beginning of and really reinforcing what my message is about giving voice back to the clay, all the pieces that were broken when back in, in our history, and really give them the voice back to really comment on all the subjects that are happening today. Like this piece here, um, a lot of the people um, don't talk about what of the molestations that happen in the churches in, in Santa Fe. And, um, you, nothing's ever done about it. The, the people that did it were just moved to another church and nothing was done about it. But once when, um, when they first came to, our, um, to the Pueblo land area, um, a lot of the, the people were enslaved to build churches and to, um, how, right. how did they say that? We we're talking about that earlier. I can't remember, but how, just to really like how they're how, enslaved, how they're enslaved, just to build us and well, uh, for food, manual labor, sex, everything, everything. So mm -hmm. nobody talks about it. But this pot here is basically a nun and um, S&M and latex gear telling you to be quiet and not talk about it. <laughs> this piece comments on the cyber bullying. Um, I was able to talk to a lot of students about um, to ask help when they're cyber bullied. Um, for, through the University of New Mexico, and it was really cool because some of them really felt the need to talk about it, and once we have a, a, a piece of art in front of us to talk about it, then it's, able, it's a lot easier for them to talk about it, but you can see the, um, I don't know, it's, it's a bull. The grotesque. I'm <laughs> using the Twitter to cyberbully, so you guys can make up your mind what it is, who it is. <laughs> <laughs> this piece is called Strength, and it was, um, we lost both our parents too to cancer and our sister. So this piece, our, our, our dad passed away two years ago. And this piece was, I made it for him. And again, just to like people that are going through chemotherapy and um, uh, radiation to be able to talk about it. Um, we had first released it in Scottsdale at the King Galleries and a group of women that are survivors came in and they're able to talk about it and share their stories, which is really awesome. And I in turn shared our stories. but. Um, our dad really hated to go into the MRI machine. So like if you see this piece sideways, if you lay her down, um, it's like that represents them going into the MRI machine. Um, the blindfold represents like when you first get diagnosed with it, but she's positioned in a way with her reaching out her hand because like she's in remission, remission right now. So you could take off the um, blindfold. How I painted it, like all the different markers that our dad and our mom would get on them, like tattoos kind of when they would get the radiation. That's what the painting represents. And um, it's a, a V maze design, and it's like the uh, never-ending quest to find a cure for cancer. 
This one deals with gun control, and it's called Up in Arms. And what just happened in Las Vegas is very terrible, but like um, children and women are the most affected by um, gun violence. So you can look at the imagery on here. This deals with the, with the obsession with selfies that a lot of our uh, nieces and nephews, teenagers, or even me, are going through. But like, it's like really wearing a mask and not even really showing who you really are in selfies to get a perfect selfie. So that's why he's wearing a mask. But you turn the canteen around and he's um, naked and the hand coming out from the side is, represents the internet asking for more, wanting more, and like how much are you going to put out there and show yourself. This one is called Alternative, and it deals with the LGBTQ community. And all these icons are um, famous music, some of my favorite music uh, people from the 80s. And back then, you know, Grace Jones, Boy George, um, uh, uh, Pete Burns from Dead or Alive, they were all doing their thing. They were all um, transgender. Um, nobody bothered them, and it was okay back then, but right now they're fight, uh, having a hard time to really fight for what they believe in. And the main character is Weiwa, and Weiwa is an iconic image and a person from the late 1800s, a Native American, two-spirit people, but I wanted to put her, him, on the cover, I mean, on the front of it, because um, to show that Native Americans really hold these two-spirit people in high, in high, um, Regard. high regards, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we all like leather and latex. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the nature of the beast. And here's that pot earlier from earlier, so you'll see different sides of the whole pot. You guys can read that really quick. <laughs> Sides of the same pot. Mm -hmm. It's all the same pot. I don't get it. <laughs> Are we good? Yeah. Okay. And this is the last slide. So you can really, um, again, like re read this really quick and then we'll. So really quick. <laughs> Real <fast. laughs> Just really quick. Just absorb all that really quick. What were some of the topics that we were discussing? One of the things that you mentioned earlier was how each of us. Does uh, or no? It was Jeremy that was mentioning that each of us are the work that we do is all really different texturally. That it all is really tactile, but the actual materials and the appearance and the touch is is really is really different um, and probably pretty obsessive. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy's the worst, though. I think. I <laughs> don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> it's a toss-up. <laughs> I mean, his his work is way more obsessive than mine. That's <laughs> well, I did. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't write a code. In there. <laughs> How many times did you do that code? Yeah. <laughs> I did have. I mean, we can certainly open up the the floor for questions. I had one question that um, came to my mind because I'm thinking about all of the things that you do in preparation just to sit down and, and create the art, and then the act of creation itself. But is there a, a a part of that process that each of you could tell me about. What is your least favorite part in the whole process, and how do you work past that to get to the finished? Like, what do you think to make yourself want to do that again? Because you keep doing it, and it, there are some parts of it that are so difficult. So just kind of go through and tell me what what you like the least. For me, you know, <laughs> for me, I think it it changes. Um, I used to be um, it used to be the binding baskets, but that's easy now. Um, I, I know when I'm doing um, quill imagery, the original, when I'm designing it, from when I go to the design to putting it on bark before I actually put quills down, that's, I really don't like that part. Because quill work is unforgiving. It has to be, you have to have everything done before you even start the quill work because you put quills in, you're putting holes in the bark. I mean, if you put one misplaced quill, it, there's nothing you can do about it. So that part really really slows me up. And two of these three artists have experience with porcupines, <laughs> which is unusual for a panel. <laughs> the majority of people have worked in quills. Um, 
my least favorite part is the last 15 to 10 percent because by then I've been thinking about it and planning it for so long and a lot of beadwork is uh, really unexciting fill work so you you know the outline is about two percent of it and then there's just filling it in and filling it in and keeping it perfect and trying to be consistent and so the design part is all in the beginning and then after that um, you're still making decisions but the creativity part is less and then it's kind of a grind and by the last 10 percent I don't even want to see it anymore I don't want to look at it I don't want to see it I don't want to beat it I want somebody else to come in and finish it I don't want anything to do with it in my and in my head I've kind of already moved on to the next project because I've been especially a large project I've been with it for so long that I'm you know I'm kind of sick of it and I also lose confidence in it I, I think it's terrible by you know, pretty much anything by the last 10 percent of a big project I think it's just awful I don't understand why I ever made it in the first place I don't know where I got the idea I don't like it I don't want to finish it I don't think anyone else is gonna like it and I really need to just like I have to power through finish the last stitches glue it on and then like not look at it for a while because I, it, you become so embedded with it and just by the time I'm done with a big project like that I just want to Jackson Pollock paint I just want to do big <laughs> like uncontrolled expressive stuff because it's like hundreds of hours of really tight control and and so it only takes a couple of days before I'm ready to start the new project though and move on but I also try to maintain different types of projects I usually have one big one medium and then some small stuff because if I do get totally burned out on a big project I need something else to turn to to kind of cleanse the palette a little bit and so I, I try to do like a shorter, you know, eight hour project or 10 hour project that feels like I actually finished something mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of feeling like I'm toiling away at one project for four months. So I, I try to sort of change it up so that I can do a jewelry piece or a smaller piece to kind of, especially if I'm working with one color. I mean, if you've been doing nothing but sewing blue beads for four days, you have got to look at something else. <laughs> you know, you just like, I just need something else. So. <laughs> so I know it's like I, I pre-thread sometimes 25 needles and just have them all in a row pre-threaded knotted ready to go and I just dial up the Netflix and just or I'm really nerdy and I watch Yale University online lectures so I've watched that I watched an entire semester of epidemiology history three times <laughs> I know everything about cholera everything <laughs> but uh but yeah it's the last 10 percent i just wish i could hand it over to a fresh me like yeah. a clone me and just say you do the you do the last of it you you finish it up because i'm i'm done with it now well thank you for finishing the one that's <laughs> and we do love it <laughs> and you oh i was i think i was very lucky because i grew up with the and loving all the the whole entire process of making the pottery <clears throat> Um, trying to teach my nieces and nephews, they're like, I don't want to make the paint, I don't want to make the clay, I'm like, I don't want to sand, but uh, I've just been lucky with it, but I will say the hardest thing is, is uh, we, the firing process is the last thing that happens when we're making the pottery, and after about three weeks of work, you're firing it, and you hear just a little thump in the firing, and we can't uncover it until it's cooled down, so when you pull it off, uh, pull out the cow manure because we caught a uh, pit fire and we take it off and the piece is shattered so that's the hardest thing to do with that but um, I used to get really mad <laughs> when I was young but well, my parents my mom would just say like accept it as that's uh, you know that's just part of the process and I've been okay with it Alright, um, I don't know if we have a microphone to pass around or you guys can Okay, that's fine. Uh, if you just want to holler it out, holler it out, and we'll try to repeat the question. Yes, I could tell from the spines how big your pieces are, especially on the straight slide. That yeah. You now I'm just curious, how, you know, are they small? Um, they varied, but like the strength piece was like about twenty, uh, maybe two and a half feet tall. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So they're sub they're substantial. Yeah, they're like so, a, I mean, that's like my whole. My whole, uh, I really want to bring back the size as well to the pieces that were made in the 1800s. Um, a lot of people are afraid to do that in the Pueblo using the traditional methods and materials because it's, again, a lot of hard uh, work to get to that point. And 
uh, if there's a slight little air bubble in it, it'll blow up. But usually I work about maybe two feet through, like three feet tall is what my normal size of work is. Because I think what a lot of people, they've seen storytellers that were made, they expect something like this high, yeah. you know, sort of tabletop, sort of <clears throat> tourist size that right. was made for sale and for that commercial. Yeah, and, yeah, I, and I mean, it is. It's yeah, what for, was yeah. made for commercial because most collectors, you know, if they're coming on the train and they're visiting Easy the Pueblos, transport. they're not going to take a two and a half foot tall. It's not commercially viable. So, you know, so by yeah. doing bigger pieces, you're reinvigorating. Right. But it's also a big risk because bigger pieces have a much greater chance of, of not making it through the firing exactly. process. And it, yeah, they lost the size just because of easy transportation. And that's why like, the pieces from the 1800s used to be over three feet tall. So that's my goal is to get back to that size. It's monumental. Yeah. The largest one you've ever done. Just a little over three feet. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's kind of scary to do it, but like you just have to push yourself to do it. So um, hopefully on my next show, call it Viathon. I might get there. Wow. Daedalus. <laughs> I, Describe that process a little bit. Yeah, the question what, was, how do you pit fire when you're using, when you have a, an object that big? Well, how we pit fire them, we just have an open grate on the ground outside. Um, then we have a, a pumice stone, and I fire one piece at a time. So like the pots all fire upside down, and the figures are standing up. And, like say a figure, pretend this is a figure here. We have um, chicken wire that we probably put about five inches, uh, sculpt like a little cocoon around it and leave like five inches around, and then we cover it with uh, cow manure, dry cow manure, and then we use aspen wood and um, uh, cedar to start the fire with. So we light it from all sides, and it burns from the outside in, and that creates a kiln. So then the, the cow manure stays um, whole, and it's sitting on, on the chicken wire, so it'll just burn like that. And then once it cools down, then you can just really carefully take it off. Because like if you take it off too early and the piece is still hot, if some of the ash falls onto the piece, then it'll get a, a fire cloud. So we usually just let it completely dry, uh, I mean completely cool. cool down, and then take it off. And it's usually about a two-hour firing, of like a really big fire. <laughs> In the back there? Yeah, I, um, I kind of did skip through that, huh? Um, I learned from my mother. And like she said, I come from eight generations of weavers. My grandfather, whoa, my grandmother, and so on and so forth. But the, um, the style that I work in, uh, my mother learned from another elder in the community, a different family. Um, so my, my style is different from the family style. And then again, it's more um, contemporary as well, so it's even different again. But... I learned from my mother originally. Jeremy and Molly, both of you talk about the regimentation of doing your art. Have you ever thought what would happen if you went from less representational and more abstract to so that, I mean, just a basket Irregular. Well, it's funny. We were talking about this the other day. When, when I was a child, I had a childish view of art. Um, I just, I, my first, really, my first definition of art was to reproduce something I saw as realistically as I possibly could. And that's, I thought that was art. That's it. So, and but I've, I've kept a little bit of that in my, in my work, whereas. When I, I try to make things as crystal clear and as, as, as pristine as they can be. Um, and so that whole, I've thought of the concept, believe me, but th that whole concept kind of was against my own in, inner, inner feelings. And I, another thing that, that makes it hard is when I look at other um, contemporary weavers that are doing freeform stuff, like, you know, baskets coming around inside themselves and tying themselves into knots. Whoa. Well, they've done it, so I can't do that. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, there, there are, I, I do have ideas like that. 
Um, but it's a very slow process because you still have to go up and down over and I mean, they still have to be interlocked weavings. And so you're, you're mathematically bound to a certain, a certain approach unless I, you know, it's slow. Progress is slow at this point. I've only known Jeremy for two days, but I think if he did something freeform, he'd crack. <laughs> <laughs> I think, he would just, <laughs> I think that would be the last well, straw. Like, like when she gets done with her work that she's been staring at this close, and she's like, I hate this. That's kind of like, you got to step back and, you know, so I, I, I kind of. Well, I think, if, I think when we're yeah. too close, I mean, I feel the same way sometimes. I, I see every detail up close, and it's just like, ah, and all, in these little, in these little, visions of what you're doing, it can just look horrible. But when you step back and you see the full finished piece, it, it, it's what it was supposed to be. I've actually, my piece here is an ex was uh, probably a first experiment in doing something more free form. Um, most of my work is very regimented, very pre-planned, not a lot of spontaneity. Um, fiber art, needlework, beadwork does not lend itself to spontaneity. Um, it, by its nature, it's pre-planned and you know, centered, and, and especially if coming from the standpoint of, of historically making functional objects, where the beadwork is ornamenting a functional object. So you don't free-form bead moccasins because you have a plan to make footwear. So you know, you're not just making a, a sampler or, or a wall hanging. And so in the first place, I had to really struggle with the idea um, once I was meshing my uh, cultural background with my art school education of making non-functional objects. And so, you know, uh, I was taught to make everything has a function. You make things with a purpose. And the beadwork is just ornamenting the object with a purpose. And making something that is purposeless is kind of disrespectful and a waste of time. And, I, and that was a cultural teaching that I was taught. You don't make things that are useless. You know, you ornament useful things so that your useful things are beautiful. And, but then once I'm in art school and I'm making things that I know nobody's ever going to use, they're not functional, um, that was a really, that was a struggle for me to sort of think that through that concept and decide how I'm going to approach it. And um, Jackie Larson Bread, who's a well-known bead worker, uh, was a friend and a mentor to my mom, and I didn't know Jackie was famous. <laughs> she's won Santa Fe more times than I, I literally, I don't know how many times she's won Santa Fe. She's amazing. She does uh, realistic portraiture and beadwork. And I just knew because she was in Great Falls and she was my mom's friend. Um, she had a talk, her and I have talked about that and you know, she has decided to continue that her beadwork will always ornament functional objects even if she knows the person will never use them. And so her purses are lined, they're functional, the handle is strong enough to hold. And so she, she maintains the functionality. And I had to decide at a certain point that I was more interested in imagery and that I was willing to let go of function and to acknowledge that these things were just going to be hung on a wall. And so it's okay to just make a wall hanging or an image or a, a box that I know nobody's ever going to open up. Um, or if they open up, I beat it on the inside and they can't use it. Um, or the box opens up. So that's what functionality is, is something that led me to make things that are more, in some respects, more spontaneous because when you let go of the purpose, you can let go of the restrictions of the purpose that it places on the object. And the piece here, I intentionally wanted to have a different aesthetic than I normally do, and I wanted to break out a little bit of the rigidity of trying to make things perfect. And so the piece here, the central map piece, um, has some elements in it that I've never done before. I've left a lot of raw edges. I used a reverse applique method. So I put two layers of silk and actually sewed the outline of the Chesapeake Bay and then cut away the top layer to reveal the bottom layer and left all of those raw edges and even frayed them. Um, I did free form quilting and sewing and left raw edges everywhere and that's really hard for me. I was like found myself like tacking them down and trying to control them and stuff. And doing freeform embroidery that didn't really have a plan and doing lots of layers and then adding paint on it. So this piece here is a bit of a departure for me because it's not controlled. And it's, I wanted to start incorporating some other fiber work techniques that were more about expression rather than perfection of technique. I'm not very good at it yet. I'm not very good at messy and spontaneity. 
I, I have a hard struggle with that. It's like trying to force yourself to have fun or something. <laughs> I'm like, no, but keeping everything in a row is fun too. <laughs> yeah. We'll get into mud. Let's go. <laughs> I, mud and I, fire. Actually, my emphasis in college was ceramics. <laughs> Oh, cool. Nice. I, I'm not really good at pottery, but I love that department because everybody was about spontaneity, and my professors were trying to teach me how to make multiples and just cut them up and trash them when yeah, I was done, yeah. and to make lots of something. And See, I like to, how permanent it can be. Yeah. Like and my so, stuff, you can't put it in the window. You can't put it in the sun. No. You can't be too wet or too dry. It's just, it's got to be just oh, right, the Goldilocks yeah. zone for right. the basket. But I got in trouble making, I love to make clay, the process, making it from dry ingredients from scratch. But I was so OCD that I was sieving the clay so many times that it had no body anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> my classmates were trying to throw with the porcelain or the terracotta I made. It just, they were like, you got to stop. There's, you can't actually perfect it by taking all of the temper and, and grit out of it. It's just like mud. <laughs> right. So I, I, I would, took it too far. But it was a really good, working with clay was a good experience. And that's what my emphasis in college was. Wow. Because cool. they had no fiber art. That wasn't an option. So I just picked the coolest people and, like and worked in their department. <laughs> we might have time for one more question or not? Uh, one more? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> it's like trick question. I know. Yeah, the question no. is about yeah, the no, my father's, ancestry and my father's non-native. My father's non-native. So. And my dad is uh, Irish Catholic, make on the make, um, <laughs> and <laughs> or lace curtain Irish, I think is what we call. It. And uh, and then my mom's background is mixed uh, Scottish, uh, Lebanese, and native. And there's probably a lot of other <clears throat> stuff mixed in there. But. Both of my parents are from Cochiti. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one thing about growing up in Montana, though, is the politics around being Native are, um, it's very political. So it's, it's, it's not really socially, you don't get to be part Native. You kind of have to pick. And so if you're Native, it, it doesn't really matter if you're an eight, politically and socially, you're other. And so it's kind of, you know, uh, if you're, you either have to sort of totally abandon that part of yourself and just be totally mainstream Anglo, or if you're native, then you're, then you identify that way, then that's how you're grouped socially and politically. Well, thank you guys for coming. And if you have something else you want to share with the artists, you, you're welcome to stay. Yeah, we've, uh, we've just got momentum. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you.